Homo sapiens. That's what our species is called. It means wise man. One of our distinguishing features that makes us wise is our ability to contemplate the future. So, how many of you have thought far enough into the future to plan what you're doing for dinner tonight? <laughs> I'm looking for audience participation here. <laughs> okay, great. You, what's your name? Melissa. Melissa. Okay. Now I'm gonna ask all of you to really stretch yourselves and use those homo sapiens skills. Think about what life might be like for Melissa 30 years from now, the year 2050. Melissa will leave her house, which was built by a 3D printer, get into her self-driving car, or maybe cars will even be flying by then, and go pick up her grandchildren Apple, and Mac from their last day of school. <laughs> Apple and Mac have a brand new baby sister, so they get to go on summer vacation to Mars with Melissa. They use augmented reality while they're in the car to make sure they've packed everything at home. We don't need smartphones anymore. Melissa is feeling a little bit nervous because she's recovering from knee replacement surgery. But her prosthetic knee is supposed to make her be able to run faster and jump higher. So she's pretty sure she'll be able to keep up with Apple and Mac on vacation. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? Yes. Well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, for Melissa's grandchildren to be born, and for her to get that prosthetic knee, do you know what we need? Antibiotics. And unfortunately, by the year 2050, we may not have any that work. Now I'm gonna ask all of you a series of questions. If you raise your hand for any of them, and please do raise your hands, keep it raised until I'm done. Ready? Okay. How many of you know someone who has had a C-section, joint replacement surgery, cancer chemotherapy, an organ transplant? How many of you know someone who takes medicine for diabetes, asthma, rheumatoid arthritis? Look around the room. That's a lot of people, right? If we don't have antibiotics that work, these modern advances in medicine that we benefit from today won't be possible due to the risk of infection. If we can't effectively treat infections, the risks associated with these medical procedures and therapies will be too great. That would be devastating, don't you think? Antibiotic resistance is one of the most serious threats to public health in the US and around the world. So what is it? What is antibiotic resistance? It is not your body becoming resistant to an antibiotic. It is when bacteria become resistant to an antibiotic. They develop the ability to defeat the drugs designed to kill them allowing the bacteria to survive, continue to grow, and cause infection. So why is this a problem? Why do we care? Quite simply, drug-resistant infections are more difficult to treat, cause more deaths, and cost more money. It's a lose-lose-lose proposition. Every year in the United States, at least two million people are infected with antibiotic-resistant organisms, and at least 23,000 die as a result. And this is most likely an underestimate. Globally, at least 700,000 people die every year due to drug resistance in bacterial infections, malaria, TB, and HIV-AIDS. This is one and a half times the entire population of Omaha dying every year. 
Let me say that again. 700,000 people dying every year now in the present day, not 30 years from now. Oh, but that's not all. <laughs> How many of you have taken an antibiotic in the past year? For 30 to 50% of you, that's one-third to one-half of you, that antibiotic was either inappropriate or completely unnecessary. And the kicker is that antibiotic use is a key driver of antibiotic resistance. Remember how I said we're homo sapiens? We're humans, right? Well, turns out we're only partially human. 43% actually. The rest of the cells in our body, are, or our microbiome, are bacteria, viruses, and fungi. So let's go back to Melissa and pretend that she has bacterial pneumonia, an infection in her lungs. Sorry, Melissa. <laughs> and she also has a prescription for an antibiotic. Under normal conditions, when Melissa does not have an active infection, she's only 43% human, meaning that the remaining 57% of cells in Melissa's body are bacteria, viruses, and fungi. That's a lot of cells. Within that large number of cells, there may be a small number of bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotic that was prescribed to Melissa. If Melissa takes the antibiotic, regardless of whether or not it's appropriate, all the bacteria in her body are exposed to that antibiotic. In other words, the antibiotic doesn't know to kill only the bacteria causing the infection in Melissa's lungs. Instead, that antibiotic kills any bacteria that are susceptible to it, whether they're causing the infection or their innocent bystander bacteria in Melissa's gut, for example. When the susceptible bacteria are gone, that small number of resistant bacteria can now multiply and even transfer their resistance to other bacteria in Melissa's body. And then Melissa can spread those resistant organisms to other people. This is why antibiotic use is a key driver of antibiotic resistance. Okay, wait. Now you might be thinking, well, this isn't really that big of a problem because there are always new antibiotics coming out. If I develop resistance to one, I can just use another one, right? Wrong. We've seen an 80% decrease in the number of new antibiotics approved by the FDA over the last three years decades. So no, you can't count on new agents to be available. Okay, okay, now you might be thinking, well, this doesn't really apply to me because I hardly ever take antibiotics. Well, I hate to break the news to you, but even if you've never taken an antibiotic, you can still become infected with an antibiotic-resistant organism. We're talking about infectious diseases, infections, that can be spread from one person to another, and resistant organisms that can be spread from one person to another, even if you've never taken an antibiotic. So am I saying you should never take antibiotics? Absolutely not. Antibiotics save lives, plain and simple. They really are miracle drugs. But we need to reframe the way we think about antibiotics. First, recognize that antibiotic resistance is a problem now, in the present day. We don't need to wait 30 years to see the negative effects. It's going to get worse, but it's bad enough as it is. We need to take action now. Second, understand that antibiotics have side effects. They can be relatively minor, like nausea or dizziness, but antibiotics can also cause serious problems, like kidney damage, 
severe diarrhea, or even death. We shouldn't put ourselves at this risk unless we actually need an antibiotic. And third, we need to treat antibiotics as a shared, precious resource. If I take an antibiotic and resistance develops and spreads, it may impact the effectiveness of that antibiotic in you. If you take an antibiotic and resistance develops and spreads, it may impact the effectiveness of that antibiotic in your children, and so on. Antimicrobials are unique. This is unlike any other class of drugs. If I take a drug for high blood pressure, for example, it has no impact on whether or not that drug will work for you. The way we use antimicrobials today affects how well they will work or if they will work at all in the future. They are a shared resource. We need to preserve this resource. We need to cherish antibiotics or perish. Now, I am not exaggerating when I say that we are on the verge of returning to a pre-antibiotic era where people may die of relatively simple infections, like wound infections or diarrheal diseases. Before antibiotics, diseases caused by bacteria, specifically pneumonia, TB, and gastrointestinal illnesses, were the top three causes of death in the United States. So let's imagine the year 2050 again. If we don't conserve our antimicrobials, if we fail to control antimicrobial resistance, the death toll around the world will exceed 10 million people each year. 10 million people each year. That's more than cancer and diabetes combined. That means one person will die every three seconds. Think about that. This will cost the world over $100 trillion in lost output, more than 300 times the net worth of Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and our very own Warren Buffett combined. Remember, we're homo sapiens wise men and women. So let's act like it and cherish the antibiotics we have or perish without them. So let's review what we've covered so far. <laughs> <laughs> Antibiotic resistance is increasing. It's bad for patients and economies. It's fueled by antibiotic use. And we have a lot of inappropriate antibiotic use and not a lot of new options. Antibiotics are a shared resource. This is a problem we should care about. We need to care about, because we have a glimpse of what might happen if we don't. The beauty of it is, there's something we can do about it. We all have a role to play. I'll give you three simple things you can do now, the three Ps. Prevent infections, be proactive, and prescription only. So number one, prevent infections. Has anyone heard of Ignaz Semmelweis? And no, it's not some trendy new beer. <laughs> okay, for those of you who haven't, he was a Hungarian physician who, in the 1840s, introduced the concept of hand hygiene into medical practice. He was able to show that washing your hands significantly decreased maternal mortality. Unfortunately, he was ridiculed for years by his peers for this radical idea. Ultimately, he was committed to a mental institution where he died at age 47 due to complications from an infected wound in his right hand. Remember, he lived in the pre-antibiotic era. So we have known about the importance of hand hygiene for 175 years. Yet hand hygiene compliance today is only 25 
to 50% amongst healthcare providers in hospitals. So, telling you to wash your hands, cover your cough, stay home when you're sick, get your vaccinations, and teach your children about infection prevention may sound like common sense, but the fact is, we don't do these things well enough. We need to do better, and we can do better. Number two, be proactive. And this applies to both healthcare providers and patients. If you're a provider, don't assume your patients want antibiotics. Talk to them about what their expectations are. And if you're a patient and your doctor prescribes an antibiotic, ask questions. Is it really necessary? Can you watch and wait? Are there alternatives? And definitely don't demand antibiotics for you or your loved ones, or even your not-so-loved ones. <laughs> and three, prescription only. When antibiotics are needed, take only those obtained with a prescription and take them exactly as prescribed. Don't buy over-the-counter antibiotics available in some countries and never share antibiotics with anyone. The three Ps, prevent infections, be proactive, and prescription only. So let's make sure that Melissa's grandchildren can be born, she can get that prosthetic knee, and of course we want her to be able to go on vacation to Mars. In the end, I ask you to remember, cherish or perish. Thank you. <laughs>